The entire airplane is a piece of armor. It is a flying tank. You can shoot the leading edges of the wings off or blow sections of wing off or a fuselage, and the airplane still flies. It almost harks back to the World War II idea of the B-17 and uh, the P-47, which were very rugged airplanes and, and tended to fly home all shot up and still bring the crews home. Obviously, this guy made it back OK. Uh, yeah, he hobbled back. I'm sure he had a. Uh... I'm sure he had to clean his flight suit out because he took, he took a very severe hit. Yeah. yeah. The next day, a lot of guys were coming up to me in, in the hooch or in the squad and said, oh, PJ, did you sleep okay last night? Uh, PJ, were you laying awake last night? And on reflection, I got to thinking about it. I said, no, actually, I slept quite well, thank you. You know, I, I, said, uh, I said my prayer one at the end of the day and thank the Lord for taking care of me and recognize that we revalidated an old concept and an old term from years and years ago when uh, the eighth air force and the bombers and the fighters used to talk about coming home on a wing and a prayer and i, I think that was applicable in my case I, we brought her home on a wing and a prayer Hogs take off and head into combat every seven minutes for the duration of the war. They are universally feared by the Iraqis. Above 5,000 feet, the plane's quiet turbofans cannot be heard, and at night, the olive drab paint scheme is nearly impossible to see. In the end, these simple machines prove stealthy in their own right. One of the advantages of this high bypass ducted fan engine is that this engine is real quiet when it's running in comparison especially like if you're on a bombing run when you come in to do your bombing run if you pull your throttles back to part power you're going to reduce even more thrust and more noise and you're just going to glide in once you hit your bombing target you could power up and thrust out uh, quiet approach and who cares how much noise you produce on the way out because you've already killed them you got the, uh, the buildings the chicken marsh they sweep in silently from more than a mile away, the Gatling gun rips enemy columns apart, suddenly and without warning. Because they were slated for retirement, warthogs in the Gulf do not carry the FLIR pods that enable other aircraft to operate at night. Warthog pilots come up with an ingenious solution. The Mavericks, slung on their wings, are guided by infrared television cameras mounted in the missile's nose. A-10 crewmen use the Maverick to convey this infrared image to a tiny TV screen in the cockpit. With this, hog drivers too can see at night. Compared to something that everybody would understand, it's, it's kind of like if you took a, a, a soda straw and looked through it and tried to drive down the road, you know, with your other eye closed. With the Maverick and its ad hoc sighting system, Iraqis moving under the cover of darkness find no haven from prowling A-10s. Okay, we got people running, people running. Roger that. We didn't know there were people in there until we started looking at our films, and we could see them jumping over the berms after the first missile blew up. So these guys who had thought they had protection of hiding at night, actually it became the worst enemy. They are running out of their vehicles to take them. Yeah, I know all those guys had families and kids and brothers and sisters and all, but uh, the way I look at it, he's shooting at me and I'm shooting at him and I was just the lucky one. And that's, you know, that's not for a, a soldier or an airman to decide. We just go with our marching orders and do what we're told to do. When you were out there fighting, you were fighting a vehicle as opposed to the people in the vehicle. Uh, when I saw a tank, I, I've got to admit, I didn't think for a, a New York second about the tank crew inside. I thought about, hey, there's a tank, and uh, there goes a tank. By February 24th, D-Day arrives. Allied ground forces launch a ferocious assault on the dug-in remnants of Iraq's vaunted army. 
most feared is enemy artillery. Iraqi guns are deadly accurate and have longer range than coalition gun batteries. They soon become the A-10's primary target and meet the same fate dealt to hundreds of Iraqi tank crews. When the remnants of enemy armor attempt to flee, the slaughter is remarkable. The Iraqis were caught on the open. It was like flicking on a light in a kitchen with a bunch of cockroaches. They were pounded from the air for days. Now, warthog drivers settled into the deck-hugging job for which they first trained, close air support. With the lives of American GIs and Marines at risk, all altitude restrictions are removed, and A-10s streak in as low as 100 feet to aid the troops below. For a typical day for us, it was, uh, you'd take off and fly three sorties, you'd go back to the base, uh, refuel, rearm, come back out, back to the base, refuel, rearm, come back out. You'd work your 12 to 14 hour a day and you'd go sleep and then you'd get up the next day and do the same thing again. Plan, fly, eat and sleep and that was about all we, we did for six weeks straight. Made for a long day but uh, it really put a lot of iron and a lot of firepower out there on the target. A lot of, a lot of sorties were, were uh, flown. A-10 pilots learn to fly, as we say, in the weeds, undetected by radar or by the eyeball or by the ear. Uh, surprise becomes a terrific capability, and that was the idea. over the battlefield for nearly two hours as commanders repeatedly call upon them to dive onto enemy forces. And when they do, hog pilots often use a trick as old as combat aviation itself. A tactic all fighter pilots have used since World War I is coming out of the sun. Matter of fact, the, uh, the catchphrase in World War II was, beware the hun in the sun. And the idea is that you use the sun as a backdrop and it blinds the guy you're shooting at, whether he's in the air or whether he's on the ground. This World War I tactic can counter a very modern threat. Coming out of the sun not only blinds enemy gunners, it also provides an ideal heat source to draw Iraqi heat-seeking missiles away from their intended target. But the sun over the Gulf would soon be eclipsed. As American ground forces press home their assault, Saddam Hussein takes one last desperate stab at denying them air cover. By February 26th, over 300 Kuwaiti oil wells burn out of control. The oil fires in Kuwait, quite frankly, were a, a pretty smart military option. When uh, Saddam Hussein set them on fire, he knew that these fires, and particularly the smoke, would interfere with a lot of what the A-10 and other airplanes could do. You just can't see through smoke. High tech isn't going to get you through it. Infrared isn't going to get you through it. Good electro-optics and radar isn't going to get you through it. And the A-10, if nothing else, could fly low enough and around a lot of this smoke to overcome some of it. So it was probably a better airplane in the environment than most of the, uh, the higher altitude airplanes. A-10 pilots run the gauntlet beneath the dark clouds of smoke, and Saddam's environmental disaster does little to stem the tide. 100 hours into the ground war, it is nearly over. The battered survivors of Iraq's army flee for home. Most of those who stand their ground do so for the sole purpose of surrendering as quickly as possible to advancing coalition troops. The really surprising part of all of it was these Iraqi vehicles, some of the ones we had shot or were shooting, had been evacuated, had been vacated. Uh, because as I employ on one particular tank and I pull off and I am employing self-protection flares.